Thomas Edward Lawrence, C.B., D.S.O., the 16th of August 1888, the 19th of May 1935, known professionally as T.E. Lawrence, was a British Army officer renowned especially for his liaison role during the Sinai and Palestine campaign and the Arab revolt against Ottoman Turkish rule of 1916-18. The breadth and variety of his activities and associations, and his ability to describe them vividly in writing, earned him international fame as Lawrence of Arabia, a title which was used for the 1962 film based on his World War I activities. Lawrence was born illegitimate in Tremadog, Wales, in August 1888 to Sir Thomas Chapman and Sarah Jonna, a governess who was herself illegitimate. Chapman had left his wife and first family in Ireland to live with Sarah Jonna, and they called themselves Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence. In the summer of 1896 the Lawrences moved to Oxford, where in 1907-10 young Lawrence studied history at Jesus College, graduating with first-class honors. He became a practicing archaeologist in the Middle East, working at various excavations with David George Hogarth and Leonard Woolley. In 1908 he joined the Oxford University Officer Training Corps, undergoing a two-year training course. In January 1914, before the outbreak of World War I, Lawrence was co-opted by the British Army to undertake a military survey of the Negev Desert while doing archaeological research. Lawrence's public image resulted in part from the sensationalized reportage of the revolt by an American journalist, Lowell Thomas, as well as from Lawrence's autobiographical account, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. 1922. In 1935, he was fatally injured in a motorbike crash in Dorset. Lawrence was born on the 16th of August 1888 in Tremadog, Caernarfonshire, now Gwynedd, Wales, in a house named Gorf Wisfer, now known as Snowden Lodge. His Anglo-Irish father, Thomas Robert Ty Chapman, who in 1914 inherited the title of Westmeath in Ireland as seventh baronet had left his wife Edith for his daughter's governess Sarah Jonna. Jonna's mother, Elizabeth Jonna, have named as Sarah's father a John Jonna, shipwright journeyman, though she had been living as an unmarried servant in the household of a John Lawrence, ship's carpenter, just four months earlier. Thomas Chapman and Sarah Jonna did not marry, but were known as Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence. They had five sons of whom Thomas Edward was the second eldest. From Wales the family moved to Kirkudbright in Dumfries and Galloway, then Dinar in Brittany, then to Jersey. In 1894-96 the family lived at Langley Lodge, now demolished, set in private woods between the eastern borders of the New Forest and Southampton Water in Hampshire. Mr Lawrence sailed and took the boys to watch yacht racing in the Solent off Leap Beach. By the time they left, the eight-year-old Ned, as Lawrence became known, had developed a taste for the countryside and outdoor activities. In the summer of 1896 the Lawrences moved to Two Polstead Road in Oxford, where, until 1921, they lived under the names of Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence. Lawrence attended the city of Oxford High School for Boys, where one of the four houses was later named Lawrence in his honor. The school closed in 1966. As a schoolboy, one of his favorite pastimes was to cycle to country churches and the make brass rubbings. Lawrence and one of his brothers became commissioned officers in the Church Lads Brigade at S.D. Aldate's church. Lawrence claimed that in about 1905, he ran away from home and served for a few weeks as a boy soldier with the Royal Garrison Artillery at S.T. Moore's Castle in Cornwall from which he was brought out. No evidence of this can be found in army records. Middle East Archaeology At the age of 15 Lawrence and his school friend Cyril Beeson bicycled around Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, visited almost every village's parish church, studied their monuments and antiquities and made rubbings of their monumental brasses. Lawrence and Beeson monitored building sites in Oxford and presented their finds to the Ashmolean Museum. The Ashmolean's annual report for 1906 said that the two teenage boys by incessant watchfulness secured everything of antiquarian value which has been found. In the summers of 1906 and 1907 Lawrence and Beeson toured France by bicycle, collecting photographs drawings and measurements of medieval castles. From 1907 to 1910 Lawrence studied history at Jesus College, 
Oxford. In the summer of 1909 Lawrence set out alone on a three-month walking tour of Crusader castles in Ottoman Syria, in which he travelled 1,000 miles, 1,600 kilometres, on foot. Lawrence graduated with first class honours after submitting a thesis entitled The Influence of the Crusades on European Military Architecture to the end of the 12th century based on his field research with Beeson in France, notably in Chilis, and his solo research in the Middle East. On completing his degree in 1910, Lawrence commenced postgraduate research in medieval pottery with a senior demi, a form of scholarship, at Magdalen College, Oxford, which he abandoned after he was offered the opportunity to become a practicing archaeologist in the Middle East. Lawrence was a polyglot whose published work demonstrates competence in French, ancient Greek, and Arabic. In December 1910 he sailed for Beirut, and on arrival went to Jbail, Biblos, where he studied Arabic. He then went to work on the excavations at Karchemish, near Jeriblis in northern Syria where he worked under D.G. Hogarth and R. Campbell Thompson of the British Museum. He would later state that everything that he had accomplished, he owed to Hogarth, as the site lay near an important crossing on the Baghdad Railway, knowledge gathered there was of considerable importance to the military. While excavating ancient Mesopotamian sites, Lawrence met Gertrude Bell, who was to influence him during his time in the Middle East. In late 1911, Lawrence returned to England for a brief sojourn. By November he was en route to Beirut for a second season at Karchemish, where he was to work with Leonard Woolley, before resuming work there. However, he briefly worked with Flinders Petrie at Kaframa in Egypt. Lawrence continued making trips to the Middle East as a field archaeologist until the outbreak of the First World War. In January 1914, Willie and Lawrence were co-opted by the British military as an archaeological smokescreen for a British military survey of the Negev Desert. They were funded by the Palestine Exploration Fund to search for an area referred to in the Bible as the Wilderness of Zin. Along the way, they undertook an archaeological survey of the Negev Desert. The Negev was of strategic importance as it would have to be crossed by any Ottoman army attacking Egypt in the event of war. William and Lawrence subsequently published a report of the expedition's archaeological findings, but a more important result was an updated mapping of the area, with special attention to features of military relevance such as water sources. Lawrence also visited Akaba and Betra. From March to May 1914, Lawrence worked again at Karchemish. Following the outbreak of hostilities in August 1914, Lawrence did not immediately enlist in the British Army, on the advice of S.F. Newcomb he held back until October, when he was commissioned on the general list, and immediately posted to the intelligence staff in Cairo. At the outbreak of the First World War Lawrence was a university postgraduate researcher who had for years travelled extensively within the Ottoman Empire provinces of the Levant. Transjordan and Palestine, and Mesopotamia, Syria and Iraq, under his own name. As such he had become known to the Ottoman Interior Ministry authorities and their German technical advisers, travelling on the German-designed, built, and financed railways during the course of his research. The Arab Bureau of Britain's Foreign Office conceived a campaign of internal insurgency against the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. The Arab Bureau had long felt it likely that a campaign instigated and financed by outside powers, supporting the breakaway-minded tribes and regional challenges to the Turkish government's centralized rule of their empire would pay great dividends in the diversion of effort that would be needed to meet such a challenge. The Arab Bureau had recognized the strategic value of what is today called the asymmetry of such conflict. The Ottoman authorities would have to devote from a hundred to a thousand times the resources to contain the threat of such an internal rebellion compared to the Allies' cost of sponsoring it. With his first-hand knowledge of Syria, the Levant, and Mesopotamia, not to mention having already worked as a part-time civilian army intelligence officer, on his formal enlistment in 1914 Lawrence was posted to Cairo on the intelligence staff of the GIG Middle East. The British government in Egypt sent Lawrence to work with the Hashemite forces in the Arabian Hejaz in October 1916. During the war, Lawrence fought alongside Arab regular troops under the command of Emir Faisal, a son of Sheriff Hussein of Mecca 
in extended guerrilla operations against the armed forces of the Ottoman Empire. Lawrence obtained assistance from the Royal Navy to turn back an Ottoman attack on Yanbu in December 1916. Lawrence's major contribution to the revolt was convincing the Arab leaders, Faisal and Abdullah, to coordinate their actions in support of British strategy. He persuaded the Arabs not to make a frontal assault on the Ottoman stronghold in Medina but allow the Turkish army to tie up troops in the city garrison. The Arabs were then free to direct most of their attention to the Turks' weak point, the Hejaz railway that supplied the garrison. This vastly expanded the battlefield and tied up even more Ottoman troops who were then forced to protect the railway and repair the constant damage. Lawrence developed a close relationship with Faisal, whose Arab Northern Army was to become the main beneficiary of British aid. In 1917, Lawrence arranged a joint action with the Arab regulars and forces including Ordu Abu Tay, until then in the employ of the Ottomans, against the strategically located but lightly defended town of Aqaba. On 6 July, after a surprise overland attack, Aqaba fell to Lawrence and the Arab forces. After Aqaba, Lawrence was promoted to major, and the new commander-in-chief of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, General Sir Edmund Allenby, agreed to his strategy for the revolt, stating after the war, I gave him a free hand. His cooperation was marked by the utmost loyalty, and I never had anything but praise for his work, which, indeed, was invaluable throughout the campaign. He was the mainspring of the Arab movement and knew their language, their manners and their mentality. Lawrence now held a powerful position, as an advisor to Faisal and a person who had Allenby's confidence. Battle of Tufile In January 1918, the Battle of Tufile, an important region southeast of the Dead Sea, was fought using Arab regulars under the command of Jafar Pasha al -Iskari. The battle was a defensive engagement that turned into an offensive rout, and was described in the official history of the war as a brilliant feat of arms. Lawrence was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his leadership at Tefili, and was also promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. By the summer of 1918, the Turks were offering a substantial reward for Lawrence's capture with one officer writing in his notes, though a price of £15,000 has been put on his head by the Turks, no Arab has, as yet, attempted to betray him. The Sharif of Mecca, King of the Hejaz, has given him the status of one of his sons, and he is just the finely tempered steel that supports the whole structure of our influence in Arabia. He is a very inspiring gentleman adventurer. Fall of Damascus Lawrence was involved in the build-up to the capture of Damascus in the final weeks of the war. Much to his disappointment, and contrary to instructions he had issued, he was not present at the city's formal surrender, arriving several hours after the city had fallen. Lawrence entered Damascus around 9 a.m. on 1 October 1918, but was only the third arrival of the day, the first being the 10th Australian Light Horse Brigade led by Major ACN Harry Olden who formally accepted the surrender of the city from acting Governor Emir said in newly liberated Damascus, which he had envisaged as the capital of an Arab state, Lawrence was instrumental in establishing a provisional Arab government under Faisal. Faisal's rule as king, however, came to an abrupt end in 1920, after the Battle of Maysalaun, when the French forces of General Gourod, under the command of General Mariano Goybid, entered Damascus, destroying Lawrence's dream of an independent Arabia. During the closing years of the war he sought, with mixed success, to convince his superiors in the British government that Arab independence was in their interests. The secret Sykes-Picot agreement between France and Britain contradicted the promises of independence he had made to the Arabs and frustrated his work. In 1918 he cooperated with war correspondent Lowell Thomas for a short period. During this time Thomas and his cameraman Harry Chase shot a great deal of film and many photographs which Thomas used in a highly lucrative film that toured the world after the war. Lowell Thomas, went to Jerusalem where he met Lawrence, whose enigmatic figure in Arab uniform fired his imagination. With Allenby's permission he linked up with Lawrence for a brief couple of weeks. Returning to America, Thomas, early in 1919, started his lectures, supported by moving pictures of veiled women, Arabs in their picturesque robes, camels and dashing Bedouin cavalry 
which took the nation by storm, after running at Madison Square Gardens in New York. On being asked to come to England, he made the condition he would do so if asked by the King and given Drury Lane or Covent Garden. He opened at Covent Garden on the 14th of August 1919, and so followed a series of some hundreds of lecture film shows, attended by the highest in the land. Lawrence returned to the United Kingdom a full colonel. Immediately after the war, Lawrence worked for the Foreign Office, attending the Paris Peace Conference between January and May as a member of Faisal's delegation. He served for much of 1921 as an advisor to Winston Churchill at the Colonial Office. On 17 May 1919 the Handley Page typo carrying Lawrence on a flight to Egypt crashed at the airport of Roma Sentosal. The pilot and co-pilot were killed. Lawrence survived with a broken shoulder blade and two broken ribs. During his brief hospitalization, he was visited by King Victor Emmanuel III. In August 1919 Lowell Thomas launched a colorful photo show in London entitled With Allenby in Palestine which included a lecture, dancing, and music. Initially, Lawrence played only a supporting role in the show. But when Thomas realized that it was the photos of Lawrence dressed as a Bedouin that had captured the public's imagination, he photographed him again, in London, in Arab dress. With the new photos, Thomas relaunched his show as with Allenby in Palestine and Lawrence in Arabia in early 1920, it was extremely popular. Thomas' shows made the previously obscure Lawrence into a household name. In August 1922, Lawrence enlisted in the Royal Air Force as an aircraftman under the name John Hume Ross. At the RAF Recruiting Centre in Covent Garden, London, he was interviewed by a recruiting officer, Flying Officer W. E. Johns, later to be well known as the author of the Biggles series of novels. Johns rejected Lawrence's application as he correctly believed Ross was a false name. Lawrence admitted this was so and the documents he provided were false and left but he returned some time later with an rough messenger, carrying a written order for Johns to accept Lawrence. However, Lawrence was forced out of the RAF in February 1923 after being exposed. He changed his name to T.E. Shaw and joined the Royal Tank Corps in 1923. He was unhappy there and repeatedly petitioned to rejoin the RAF which finally readmitted him in August 1925. A fresh burst of publicity after the publication of Revolt in the Desert, see below, resulted in his assignment to a remote base in British India in late 1926, where he remained until the end of 1928. At that time he was forced to return to Britain after rumours began to circulate that he was involved in espionage activities. He purchased several small plots of land in Chingford built a hut and swimming pool there, and visited frequently. This was removed in 1930 when the Chingford Urban District Council acquired the land and passed it to the City of London Corporation, but re-erected the hut in the grounds of the Warren, Lawton, where it remains, neglected, today. Lawrence's tenure of the Chingford land has now been commemorated by a plaque fixed on the sighting obelisk on Pole Hill. He continued serving in the rough based at Bridlington, East Riding of Yorkshire, specialising in high-speed boats and professing happiness, and it was with considerable regret that he left the service at the end of his enlistment in March 1935. Lawrence was a keen motorcyclist, and, at different times, had owned eight broad superior motorcycles. His eighth motorcycle is on display at the Imperial War Museum. Among the books Lawrence is known to have carried with him on his military campaigns is Thomas Mallory's Morty Dartha. Accounts of the 1934 discovery of the Winchester manuscript of the Morty include a report that Lawrence followed Eugene Vinauver, a Mallory scholar, by motorcycle from Manchester to Winchester upon reading of the discovery in the Times. At the age of 46, two months after leaving military service, Lawrence was fatally injured in an accident on his Bra Superior SS100 motorcycle in Dorset, close to his cottage, Clouds Hill, near Wem. A dip in the road obstructed his view of two boys on their bicycles, he swerved to avoid them, lost control, and was thrown over the handlebars. He died six days later on 19 May 1935. The spot is marked by a small memorial at the side of the road. One of the doctors attending him was the neurosurgeon Hugh Cairns, 
who consequently began a long study of what he saw as the unnecessary loss of life by motorcycle dispatch riders through head injuries. His research led to the use of crash helmets by both military and civilian motorcyclists. Moorton Estate, which borders Bovington Camp, was owned by Lawrence's cousins the Frampton family. Lawrence had rented and later bought Clouds Hill from the Framptons. He had been a frequent visitor to their home, Oakerswood House, and had for years corresponded with Louisa Frampton. With his body wrapped in the Union flag, Lawrence's mother arranged with the Framptons for him to be buried in their family plot at Moreton. His coffin was transported on the Frampton estate's pier. Mourners included Winston and Clementine Churchill, E. M. Forster and Lawrence's youngest brother, Arnold. A bust of Lawrence was placed in the crypt at St. Paul's Cathedral, London and a stone effigy by Eric Kennington remains in the Anglo-Saxon Church of St. Martin, Worm in Dorset. Writings Throughout his life, Lawrence was a prolific writer. A large portion of his output was epistolary, he often sent several letters a day. Several collections of his letters have been published. He corresponded with many notable figures including George Bernard Shaw, Edward Elgar, Winston Churchill, Robert Graves, Noel Coward, E. M. Forster, Siegfried Sassoon, John Buchan, Augustus John and Henry Williamson. He met Joseph Conrad and commented perceptively on his works. The many letters that he sent to Shaw's wife, Charlotte, are revealing as to his character. In his lifetime, Lawrence published three major texts. The most significant was his account of the Arab Revolt, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Two were translations, Homer's Odyssey, and The Forest Giant, the latter an otherwise forgotten work of French fiction. He received a flat fee for the second translation, and negotiated a generous fee plus royalties for the first. Lawrence's major work is Seven Pillars of Wisdom, an account of his war experiences. In 1919 he had been elected to a seven-year research fellowship at All Souls College, Oxford, providing him with support while he worked on the book. In addition to being a memoir of his experiences during the war, certain parts also serve as essays on military strategy, Arabian culture and geography, and other topics. Lawrence rewrote Seven Pillars of Wisdom three times once blind after he lost the manuscript while changing trains at Reading Railway Station. The list of his alleged embellishments in Seven Pillars is long, though many such allegations have been disproved with time, most definitively in Jeremy Wilson's authorized biography. However Lawrence's own notebooks refute his claim to have crossed the Sinai Peninsula from Akaba to the Suez Canal in just 49 hours without any sleep. In reality this famous camel ride lasted for more than 70 hours and was interrupted by two long breaks for sleeping which Lawrence omitted when he wrote his book. Lawrence acknowledged having been helped in the editing of the book by George Bernard Shaw. In the preface to Seven Pillars, Lawrence offered his thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Bernard Shaw for countless suggestions of great value and diversity and for all the present semicolons. The first public edition was published in 1926 as a high-priced private subscription edition, printed in London by Herbert John Hodgson and Roy Manning Pike, with illustrations by Eric Kennington, Augustus John, Paul Nash, Blair Hughes Stanton and his wife Gertrude Hermes. Lawrence was afraid that the public would think that he would make a substantial income from the book and he stated that it was written as a result of his war service. He vowed not to take any money from it, and indeed he did not, as the sale price was one-third of the production costs. This, along with his saint-like generosity, left Lawrence in substantial debt. Revolt in the Desert was an abridged version of Seven Pillars, which he began in 1926 and was published in March 1927 in both limited and trade editions. He undertook a needed but reluctant publicity exercise, which resulted in a bestseller. Again he vowed not to take any fees from the publication, partly to appease the subscribers to Seven Pillars who had paid dearly for their editions. By the fourth reprint in 1927, the debt from Seven Pillars was paid off as Lawrence left for military service in India. At the end of 1926, he set up the Seven Pillars Trust with his friend D. G. Hogarth as a trustee, in which he made over the copyright and any surplus income of revolt in the desert. He later told Hogarth that he had made the trust final, 
to save myself the temptation of reviewing it, if Revolt turned out a bestseller, the resultant trust paid off the debt, and Lawrence then invoked a clause in his publishing contract to halt publication of the abridgment in the United Kingdom. However, he allowed both American editions and translations which resulted in a substantial flow of income. The trust paid income either into an educational fund for children of RAF officers who lost their lives or were invalided as a result of service, or more substantially into the RAF Benevolent Fund. Posthumous Lawrence left unpublished The Mint, a memoir of his experiences as an enlisted man in the Royal Air Force, RAF. For this, he worked from a notebook that he kept while enlisted writing of the daily lives of enlisted men and his desire to be a part of something larger than himself, the Royal Air Force. The book is stylistically very different from Seven Pillars of Wisdom, using sparse prose as opposed to the complicated syntax found in Seven Pillars. It was published posthumously, edited by his brother, Professor A. W. Lawrence. After Lawrence's death, A. W. Lawrence inherited Lawrence's estate and his copyrights as the sole beneficiary. To pay the inheritance tax, he sold the U.S. copyright of Seven Pillars of Wisdom, subscribers text, outright to Doubleday Duran in 1935. Doubleday still controls publication rights of this version of the text of Seven Pillars of Wisdom in the USA. In 1936 Professor Lawrence split the remaining assets of the estate giving Clouds Hill and many copies of less substantial or historical letters to the nation via the National Trust, and then set up two trusts to control interests in T. E. Lawrence's residual copyrights to the original Seven Pillars Trust. Professor Lawrence assigned the copyright in Seven Pillars of Wisdom, as a result of which it was given its first general publication to the Letters and Symposium Trust. He assigned the copyright in the Mint and all Lawrence's letters which were subsequently edited and published in the book T. E. Lawrence by his friends, edited by A. W. Lawrence, London, Jonathan Cape, 1937. A substantial amount of income went directly to the Rough Benevolent Fund or for archaeological, environmental, or academic projects. The two trusts were amalgamated in 1986 and, on the death of Professor A. W. Lawrence in 1991, the Unified Trust also acquired all the remaining rights to Lawrence's works that it had not owned, plus rights to all Professor Lawrence's works. Lawrence's biographers have discussed his sexuality at considerable length, and this discussion has spilled into the popular press. There is no reliable evidence for consensual sexual intimacy between Lawrence and any person. His friends have expressed the opinion that he was asexual, and Lawrence himself specifically denied in multiple private letters, any personal experience of sex. While there were suggestions that Lawrence had been intimate with Dame, who worked with Lawrence at a pre-war archaeological dig in Karchemish, and fellow servicemen R.A.M. Guy, his biographers and contemporaries have found them unconvincing. The dedication to his book Seven Pillars is a poem titled To S.A., which opens, I loved you. So I drew these tides of men into my hands and wrote my will across the sky in stars to earn you freedom, the seven-pillared worthy house, that your eyes might be shining for me when we came. Lawrence was never specific about the identity of S.A. There are many theories which argue in favor of individual men, women, and the Arab nation. The most popular is that S.A. represents, at least in part, his companion Selim Ahmed, Dame who apparently died of typhus before 1918. Although Lawrence lived in a period during which official opposition to homosexuality was strong, his writing on the subject was tolerant. In Seven Pillars, when discussing relationships between young male fighters in the war, he refers on one occasion to the openness and honesty of perfect love and on another to friends quivering together in the yielding sand with intimate hot limbs in supreme embrace. In a letter to Charlotte Shaw he wrote I've seen lots of man and man loves, very lovely and fortunate some of them were. In both Seven Pillars and a 1919 letter to a military colleague, Lawrence describes an episode on the 20th of November 1917 in which, while reconnoitring Dira in disguise, he was captured by the Ottoman military, heavily beaten, 
and sexually abused by the local bay and his guardsmen. The precise nature of the sexual contact is not specified. There have been allegations that the episode was an invention of Lawrence's and, with some evidence, that the injuries Lawrence claims to have suffered were exaggerated. Although there is no independent testimony, the multiple consistent reports, and the absence of evidence for outright invention in Lawrence's works, make the account believable to his biographers. At least three of Lawrence's biographers, Malcolm Brown, John E. Mack, and Jeremy Wilson, have argued this episode had strong psychological effects on Lawrence which may explain some of his unconventional behavior in later life. There is considerable evidence that Lawrence was a masochist. In his description of the Deroa beating, Lawrence wrote a delicious warmth, probably sexual, was swelling through me and also included a detailed description of the guard's whip in a style typical of masochists' writing. In later life, Lawrence arranged to pay a military colleague to administer beatings to him, and to be subjected to severe formal tests of fitness and stamina. While John Bruce, who first wrote on this topic, included some other claims which were not credible, Lawrence's biographers regard the beatings as established fact. John E. Mack sees a possible connection between T. E's masochism and the childhood beatings he had received from his mother for routine misbehaviors. His brother Arnold thought the beatings had been given for the purpose of breaking T. E's will. Writing in 1997, Angus Calder noted that it is astonishing that earlier commentators discussing Lawrence's apparent masochism and self-loathing failed to consider the impact on Lawrence of having lost his brothers Frank and Will on the Western Front along with many other school friends. Lawrence was made a Companion of the Order of the Bath and awarded the Distinguished Service Order and the French Legion d'Honneur, though in October 1918 he refused to be made a Knight Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. A bronze bust of Lawrence was placed in the crypt of St. Paul's Cathedral alongside the tombs of Britain's greatest military leaders. An English heritage blue plaque marks Lawrence's childhood home at 2 Polstead Road. Oxford, OX2, and another appears on his London home at 14 Barton Street Westminster, SW1. In 2002, Lawrence was named 53rd in the BBC's list of the 100 Greatest Britons following a UK-wide vote.